Hey everybody, Chris here from the Other Planetarium. I'm the Collections Manager. Today we're going to play a very fun game I like to call What's in the Box? This crate here contains one of the most important and historically significant objects in our entire collection. And you guys get a sneak peek to see what it is. I'll open it up and uh, then I'll tell you a little bit about it. All right, so we've got all the screws taken out, and uh, now we just have to take the lid off. You all ready for the big reveal? All right, get ready. Ooh. So this is an Astrolabe table clock, um, and this is typically how it's shipped uh, when it goes out on loan or when it goes outside anywhere outside of the building. Every object that we have, if it's it's sent outside the building, it gets a custom crate made for it. As you can imagine, sometimes that gets pretty complicated and tricky. Some of the objects we have in our collection are uh, relatively complicated, uh, both in shape and size and materials. Um, so every case that we make or every crate that we make for an object traveling somewhere is different in some way. This one uh, came, like I said, back from the Met. And uh, I'm going to go ahead and put on some gloves here and I'll take it out and we can get some uh, close up looks at it. So as you can see, like I was saying, this is one of the most uh, stunningly beautiful pieces that we have in um, our historic artifacts collection. This is typically called uh, an astronomical or actually a table clock. Uh, we call it an Orpheus clock here at the other kind of for shorthand. And I'll tell you a little bit about why that is in, in, a, in a minute. Uh, this is from uh, the late 16th century. Uh, so uh, the late 1500s, basically from Southern Germany, either Aug Augsburg or Nuremberg. It was a real center of instrument making and metallurgy uh, at the time. And this is an incredible example of the artistry that came out of that region uh, during the late 1500s. So other than being uh, exceptionally beautiful and quite old, what makes this piece so special for the Adler's collection? Let me walk you through the face here and we can talk about it a little bit. The first thing you'll notice is a clock. Uh, obviously this is a, a table actually clock, but from here you'll see uh, the clock goes from one o'clock to 12 o'clock and then from one o'clock back to 12 o'clock. So it's a full 24 hour clock on the face here. This is the minute hand that tracks the actual time. Now on the inner band here, you'll notice a calendar. So you have October, November, December, January, February, and so on divided by days. On the innermost ring here, you will see a zodiac calendar. So you have your Sagittarius, your Capricorn, your Aquarius. So you can track the locations of the zodiac at any given time and date. This arm here represents the location of the sun uh, across the ecliptic. And this arm here represents the moon, the location of the moon as it passes over time. Now, what makes this clock so special or one of the things that makes this clock so special is this astrolabe wreath that is on the top here. Now, typically, astrolabes have been around for hundreds of years at this point, but their usefulness was starting to be subsumed by mechanical clocks. As you know, as you hopefully know, one of the main uses of an astrolabe was to tell the time based on the positioning of the stars. When mechanical clocks arrived on the scene, that kind of became a little redundant. But for a time, astrolabes and clocks coexisted as you can see in this piece, where they're basically two different uh, instruments smashed together, an astrolabe and a mechanical clock. Now, normally with an astrolabe, this wreath that you see on the top here that points out the positioning of the stars, you would move with your hand. Uh, you would manipulate it with your fingers uh, to help you tell what the time was. With this mechanical clock, the gears inside this piece actually move the wreath for you, so you don't have to do that. It can tell you the positioning of the stars based on the time of the clock. It's pretty fascinating and uh, a pretty rare piece. Earlier, I had called this the Orpheus clock. Uh, there's a reason for that. Let's explore the, uh, the side down here really quick, and I can show you why. Now, by far the most striking detail about this piece is the depiction around this, the side banding here of the myth of Orpheus. Now, if you don't know what the myth of Orpheus is and Eurydice, uh, I can tell you a little bit about it. It's a Greek myth uh, that centers around this guy. This is Orpheus over here. He is uh, a beautiful songwriter and singer. He plays the lyre uh, and he's very good at it, enchants everybody. He falls in love with this woman right here named Eurydice. Now, they are deeply in love. They get married. They live happily for a time. Uh, a couple of things happen, but uh, the long and short of it is uh, Eurydice is running through the forest and gets bitten by a snake and dies. Uh, Orpheus is obviously heartbroken. Uh, he has nobody to sing to anymore. His, the love of his life is gone. He decides to go down to the Greek underworld, uh, confront Hades, and try to get uh, Eurydice back. So he goes down there. He plays and sings uh, his lyre for uh, Hades down in the underworld. Hades is so impressed that he offers to give Eurydice back. He, allow, he offers to allow Eurydice to leave the underworld uh, and go live back up among uh, normal people. Uh, under one condition, uh, Eurydice has to follow Orpheus out of the underworld 
is she has to follow behind uh, Orpheus, and Orpheus can't look back at her. If he does, before they leave the underworld, she is trapped in the underworld forever. Orpheus, thinking, I'm a patient guy, I'm pretty good at this, I can do that, that's no problem, says, okay, makes a deal with Hades. So they start to walk out a few feet before they exit the underworld. Uh, his curiosity, his impatience, uh, his lack of faith, I assume, gets the worst of, worst of him. And uh, he takes a quick peek back to make sure that Eurydice is still there and to see her beautiful face. And instantly she just vanishes in a puff of smoke and, and is trapped back in the underworld with Hades forever. This obviously crushes Orpheus and he spends the rest of his life uh, in mourning. It's a bit of a uh, depressing uh, Greek myth, uh, but it is beautifully depicted around the entire outside of the piece here. Uh, its meaning is a little suspect. We're not 100% sure what it uh, actually means. It could be a comment on, um, since this is on a clock, it could be a comment on uh, the slow passage of time or the inevitability of death or uh, something maybe a little deeper. Uh, but it is uh, absolutely gorgeous. The outside piece here, I will rotate this a little bit here and try to stay out of the light. You can see all the way around is this gilt beautiful depiction of animals, zebras, monkeys, uh, lions, tigers, all the way around. It is an absolutely gorgeous piece. It is one of the most stunningly beautiful pieces that we have in the entire collection. Um, and it's why we're so proud of it and why it actually went and visited the, the, the Metropolitan Museum of Art for a loan uh, a while ago. 